in their seats. As a reminder, we ask everybody to please turn their cell phone and vibrate. Or if they're really brave, they can turn it off. Good evening and welcome. My name is Yehuda Polstein and I am proud to serve as the, as the Executive Director of Madregos Midwest. It is my honor to welcome you to tonight's event, Belayv Echad, one crucial night to raise mental health awareness. Brought to you by Madregos Midwest, Refua 301, and No Shame On You, with support from our close friends at Yellow Brick and Compass Health Center. I'd like to welcome our two incredible speakers, Rav Afray Meliao Shapiro and Dr. Norman Blumenthal, we are honored to have you join us this evening. It is absolutely inspiring to see all of you here tonight. What a tribute to our community that all of you have come to support such an important topic. Whether you joined us to learn more about mental health, to become more educated, whether you joined us because of a mental or emotional challenge, challenge affecting you or a loved one, or in support of Achinu Kobe Yisrael, all of us are here, believe Acha with one heart, as one community, united to address this crucial topic. Tonight we declare emphatically and with one voice, it is time to remove the stigma surrounding mental health. <laughs> mental and emotional health is a fundamental subject that impacts each part of our lives. From waking up to going to sleep, from davening to learning, from how we interact with ourselves to how we interact with others, our mental and emotional health is a vital factor in our lives. And just like our physical health, requires daily effort and attention. Our goal for tonight is to take a step together to become more aware of how mental health affects us and to develop the proper systems of support for ourselves and for our community. Before we continue, there are a number of individuals we need to thank for putting this special event together and for help making tonight a reality. Please hold your applause till I finish all the names. Rabbi Yisrael Matzliach of Refua 311, Division of Chicago, Center for Torah and Chesed. Mrs. Goldie Kasev of Chicago, Center for Torah and Chesed. Miriam Amen, Director and Founder of No Shame On You. Ms. Helena Cohn, who went above and beyond and is responsible for all the amazing packets you are holding in your hands. Rachel Karish and Yankee Greenberger, from Andreas Midwest, and along with our chairman, Mr. Yoni Bellows, and help from Sarah Comer and Annette Mazenberg of Madrigos Midwest. <laughs> May we all be Zoha to work on many more projects together. Tonight's event is a true team effort. Each organization dedicated and passionate about improving our community. Refua 301, a division of Chicago Center for Torah and Chesed, is committed to protecting our health, both physical and emotional. From referrals to patient advocacy, Refua 301 provides extensive support services to each challenges we face as individuals and as a community. Its service includes referrals to mental health professionals to facilitate the optimal shidduch between client and therapist. No Shame On You is an organization dedicated to eliminating the stigma associated with mental health conditions and raising awareness in Chicago, in Chicago Jewish community and beyond. Its goals are to enable those who need help to seek it, for family members and friends to know how to provide proper support, and to save lives through community outreach, classes and workshops, educational presentations and resources, and tools and information on social media. Madrigos Midwest develops and strengthens the emotional health of our community children community's children. We educate, motivate, guide, and support preteens, adolescents, young adults, and their families to help them achieve their personal potential and live healthy and productive lives. Our extensive array of services include the Barry and Harriet Ray Family Foundation, Steps to Healthy Living Education Initiative, as well as a full complement of enrichment programs offered year-round. This past year, Madrigos Midwest launched our Counseling Center to provide therapeutic support and clinical intervention when necessary. Our team of clinicians provide essential assessments and therapy 
led by our, our, led by our dedicated clinical directors, Rachie Karish and Yankee Greenberger. <laughs> Madresa West provides all these services with the encouragement of our dying and POSIC, Harold Shmuel First, who has been a supporter and advocate of mental health issues long before it was popular. We cannot be here tonight without the support of our corporate sponsors, Yellow Brick and Compass Health Center. Yellow Brick's mission is to serve as the national leader in psychiatric health care for emerging young adults and their families. Yellow Brick provides integrated, intensive outpatient treatments based on the frontiers of neuroscience, psychotherapy, life skills, and wellness research and practice. Yellow Brick's naturalistic, real-time, sober, open support department community model offers an immersion in expert, collaborative healing relationships. Compass Health is cutting edge in their approach to intensive level mental health treatment. Their goal is to help patients overcome debilitating psych psychiatric symptoms through scientifically proven treatment modalities. Their on-site staff include psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, family therapists, nurses, and education specialists in both Chicago and North Shore facilities. From their outstanding clinical staff to the physical space, the whole person is appreciated in creating and providing successful psychiatric treatment. We are privileged to present this evening two renowned speakers, leaders devoted to chesed and strengthening mental health. We know they will inspire and empower us with the tools to help our community, our homes, and ourselves. Rabbi Ephraim Eliyahu Shapiro, the Marada Asra Congregation Shari Tefila in North Miami Beach, is a world famous speaker and mashpia, and champion for the cause of mental health. Some of us have been fortunate to hear Rabbi Shapiro before, and have been inspired by his powerful speeches. Rabbi Shapiro is renowned for his daily shirim for the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation, and some of his Torah classes can be found on TorahAnytime.com. His reputation and relationship with Gedoli Israel testify to his Torah dedication and cloud leadership. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Shapiro. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here tonight and I'm very, very grateful to everyone who gave me this chance, this opportunity, but specifically there's one person that I want to single out for my Dragos and that's Yankee Greenberger. The, the fact that I'm here tonight is a credit to him. Uh, he, he originally called me, he asked me to come. We had many, many conversations back and forth. His attention to detail is stunning and meticulous. He has a goal. He knows what he wants to accomplish. He was crystal clear when he gave me direction about tonight's topic. And so I just want to wish Rabianki Greenberger and uh, his entire family you should only have success, Hatzlacha, continue your amazing work, and always in the best of health. I can't thank you enough. In addition to Madregos uh, hosting and sponsoring or co-hosting tonight as well, Rafua 311, as well as No Shame on You, I want to thank those organizations as well. And everyone who works for those organizations should be able to continue all that they do, and they should merit to see only Nachas in the best of health. It's a tremendous honor to be in the presence of all the Rabbanim, the Machanchim, the educators, and specifically to be here together with Dr. Norman Blumenthal. There's a tremendous, tremendous honor. What a gem and what an asset Klal Yisrael is privileged to have, and we're privileged tonight.
there's an interesting comment. Before I even tell you how I'd like to approach tonight's topic, there's an interesting comment that we say, it's words that we find in the Slichais, which means we say it between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'll tell it to you in Hebrew, then in English. Hashem says, let's come together and reason, and then He says, if your sins were stained like a dark scarlet, a crimson, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they are now like a pristine white, like a beautiful snowfall. Many ask the question, in order for a person to have a, a chet or a sin, go from a deep stained crimson to a beautiful white, a snowfall, you have to do things. Like in the area of tshuva repentance, I want to see charota, vidui, azivas achet, Regret, regret, I'm taking it upon myself not to do it in the future. There are concrete steps. What in the world did the person, pray tell, do that already God says, Already you're cleansed, you're good to go. What did the guy do? This question should really bother you. Normally, I need some concrete steps in the realm of repentance. I need to have that regret. I need to take upon myself. He didn't do anything. The person seemingly didn't do a blessed thing, and all of a sudden, he went to a beautiful snowfall. So I heard in the name some people answer very beautifully. I heard this from uh, the Jibo Dayan Rav Katz of Montreal. He said very beautifully, Did you not hear the first three words? The first three words are, Let's come together and sit and reason. And what the Rebbeinu Shalaylam is telling us is, even before you get to all the steps, even before you get to what to do and what not to do, when Hashem sees just your coming together, just your willingness to reason and to talk about something, Hashem says, stop! That in and of itself is the most ginormous step. Don't underestimate its power. Before I talk to you about the nitty gritty and what needs to be done, Hashem is saying the power of Lechuna Vinivachacha, just coming together, reasoning, being willing to talk, acknowledging that in and of itself is the most colossal beyond, beyond step that Hashem says, when I see that, for that in and of itself, you're good to go. I don't think that there could be a more appropriate introduction to tonight's evening. We will hear from Dr. Blumenthal many, many different things, and hopefully I can provide a few myself. But perhaps the most important thing, we have hundreds of men and women who came out tonight. And as you heard so eloquently in the introduction, it's a night to remove a stigma. It's a night to be there and to help and to see what I can do for someone who is having a mental health challenge. I came from Miami. Well, I did get beautiful weather. That's the truth I did. But I also came to tell you, just your coming together tonight you're bringing a topic into the openness, open. Your willingness to discuss that in and of itself is something that is beyond description, and yes, in the eyes of Hashem as well. So I think that the hundreds of people who came out tonight deserve tremendous, tremendous credit. And for that step in and of itself, don't underestimate it. For that step in and of itself, May HaKadosh Baruch who answer all of our tefillahs, help all those who need to be helped, and be there for all those who need. But just from our willingness to seek together the chunav and ivaychacha, that's like really, really big. And maybe we'll be zaycha tonight that many other communities around the globe will follow. I want to divide the words into two separate parts. Number one, 
the person who themselves, he or she, might be going through a mental health challenge, besides getting obvious help, what else is there that they might be able to do that might be comforting and helpful? As well as from the point of view of someone who's there to help a person who's going through a challenge, or to help family members of someone going through a challenge, what can we offer? Those are the two things that we have to speak about tonight. Let's talk about this second one first. Perhaps it's best said by the famous Magid Reb Shapsi somebody that I was privileged to know when I lived in Eretz Yisrael, someone who died a number of years ago. Of the ten plagues of the ten Makais that the Egyptians suffered in Mitzrayim, put the tenth one on the side, which is of course the firstborn and they're being killed. Of the first nine, if I did a spot check of the hundreds in this room and asked, which is the most funereal? Which of the nine is the worst? Believe it or not, that was the correct answer. But surprisingly, you answered that. That is right. Number nine, Chayshech, darkness, is the worst. It was. But how do you explain that? In Chayshech, there was not to the Egyptians the largest loss of human life or animal life. That happened in the earlier ones. In the earlier plagues, there was tremendous loss to human and to animal life. So how in the world do you explain that Chayshech darkness is the worst, the most funereal of all the plagues? Why? Why? The earlier plagues had much larger losses. You should open up your heart to what Shops Yudalevich says so eloquently. It's a game changer. And you'll hear it once, I assure you'll never forget it. Reb Shapsi in his inimitable style says, you're right that in the earlier plagues, the quantity of loss to human and animal life was far greater than Chayshech. That's true. But you know what? People who suffered losses had each other. They had a shoulder to cry on, someone to commiserate with, someone to wipe away their tear, someone to put an arm around their shoulder. In the plague of Chayshech, the Pasuk says, We didn't see each other, we didn't get up. In other words, we were alone. Says Reb Shapsi people can handle a lot. People can go through many vicissitudes and trials and tribulations and challenges. But I don't want to be alone because one of the most miserable feelings in the world, bar none, is for me to think I'm alone. I can tell you as a Rav, people will tell me there's a lot that I could handle, but I cannot handle being alone. In the earlier plagues, while the challenges and issues were certainly greater, they had each other. Someone to wipe away a tear. Someone to at least say, Imo Anochi Batsara, I have an idea of what you might be going through. But in Chayshech, they were alone. And when you're alone, it is from the most miserable feelings in the world. A person could go home in the evening feeling alone. You want to know how they feel? Why don't you see how wet and soaked their pillow is in the morning from the tears that they shed during the night. Nobody wants to feel alone. Alone is Chayshech. And that Rabbi Sai, my dearest friends, has got to go. And so if there is a person who knows someone who's going through a challenge, if there is someone who knows family members who has someone who's going through a challenge, I'm not asking you I'm beseeching and begging. Don't let anybody feel alone. No one should think, but I'm not a professional. But I don't know. I don't have degrees. I don't have letters after my name. There's a lot you can do. Let them know that you care. 
Of course, you will try to guide them and send them to the appropriate people. But before that, could you please remove the Chayshef? A bit ago, the Vishnitzer Rebbe, one of the great Rebbes in B'nai Brak, someone came to him and told him that he was making a wedding the next night. This man said, unfortunately, his young wife had passed away a while ago, so he was making his first wedding as an almond by himself without his wife who had passed away. He came to Rabbi Yisrael, the vision of the Rebbe, and asked him for a bracha. The Rebbe gave him a beautiful, warm bracha. And he said to him, tomorrow night after the wedding, come back to my home, I want to talk to you. He said, Rebbe, it may not end till 3, 3.30 in the morning. It doesn't make a difference, he said. I want to speak to you. And so the Alman, the single man whose wife passed away at a young age, makes the wedding the next night. Everything goes beautifully. And at about three in the morning, he comes to the home of the Vishnitzer Rebbe. The Gabbai, the attendant, is standing off to the side and wondering, what, pray tell, does the Rebbe need at 3.30 in the morning that cannot wait until tomorrow? And then he hears these types of questions being asked by the great Rebbe Yisrael of Vishnitz to the father who just married off a child by himself. Tell me, by the Chosen's tish where the men were, they had the hot dishes that you wanted and planned on? When the children were by the chuppah in their new suits and shoes, they looked good? How many no-shows would you say that there were from place cards that weren't taken? By the main, you gave a choice between meat and chicken. How many would you say took meat? How many would you say chicken? What time was dessert served? What was the favorite that went in dessert? These were the types of questions that the great Rebbe was asking this man for about an hour. When the hour ended and the man left, the Gambai turned to the Rebbe and he wondered, he asked respectfully, but he wondered at about 4.30 in the morning, those questions were asked tonight, they couldn't wait a day or two? Listen to the answer of the vision of Sereb, open your heart. He said, what is the first thing that after a person makes a simcha, after a bar mitzvah, after a chasna, what's the first thing that they do when they come home? They might come home two, three in the morning. They turn to their spouse, they have a glass of tea, maybe a piece of cake, and what do they do? They start talking about every detail, every pitchifka, every cuticle with their spouse. This man's wife passed away. Who was he going to go home and talk to? Who was he going to go home and discuss these things with? Who was he going to talk to about desserts and fish and shoes and no-shows? He wasn't going to talk to anybody. You would have found a wet pillow soaked with tears in the morning. I called him over tonight to speak to him about all the things that a spouse would normally discuss with another. You know why the Vizna Tzarebbe understood? Because nobody wants to feel alone. Chayshech is something that's lugubrious. Chayshech is something that people cannot handle. And so perhaps the most important thing that a person should realize, if they know someone going through a mental health challenge, or they know a family where somebody is going through a mental health challenge, I am beseeching you. Let them know that you care. I have a little sticker, a magnetic sticker on a filing cabinet. There's actually such a thing that still exists. And I try to live by it. It says, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Ain't that the truth? If I'm going through an issue, I am really not interested now in you coming and wowing me with every mathematical computation, with erudition, with all things. I'm not interested in that. The only thing that I want right now is, I want to know that you care. If I know that you care, that really goes a long way in removing chayshev. These actually aren't my words. The great Rabbi Yenison Eibshitz, he says something so powerful, you can find it yourself. Parshas Ve'er in Tiferes Yenison, he says, when Paro 
was putting the Jews to work, he excluded the tribe of Levi. Why? Believe it or not, astonishingly it says, he saw through his astrology that the future savior of Klal Yisrael was going to come from the tribe of Levi. Indeed it did. It was Moshe Rabbeinu. And so he didn't want to work the tribe that was going to have the ultimate person who was going to save the Jewish people. Why not? I'll tell you the six words that he says in Hebrew, then I'll translate it in English. The Mianus and Ibshit says, Paro, in his diabolical yet brilliant plan, said, Misha'eno bitzara, eno yachol That's a spiritual nuclear bomb. I'll tell it to you again before we translate it. Misha'eno bitzara, eno yachol he knew that the one who was going to have to save the Jews was coming from this tribe. So diabolically he said, I'm not going to work them and put them through slavery and difficulty. Why? Because if there's somebody who didn't properly feel someone's pain, properly empathize, but remained apathetic, ain't no yacholoi shia. They cannot possibly know what someone's going through. They cannot possibly help me out. So Paro thought brilliantly, if the person who's saving Klal Yisrael comes from a tribe that hasn't tasted pain, that hasn't tasted slavery, that hasn't tasted bitter tears, then how could he be an effective savior leader? Now we know, thank God, he was wrong. And of course, Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest leader ever the most empathetic and non-apathetic. But yet Paro understood, Misha'eno Bitsara, if you cannot try to become acutely sensitive to what a person is going through, Eino Yachol you'll never be an effective leader, you'll never be an effective person who can show care and concern. And while I get it, no two people will have the same thing and no two people have the same challenges. But at least imagine if from tonight's Lachu Navani Vaychacha, hundreds coming together and reasoning, you're asking me? So what can I practically, pragmatically, and tangibly? I'm not talking to you esoterically now. We're not talking in the sky. I'm giving you pragmatically and tangibly what you can do. Remove the chayshech. Let somebody know that you do care. It's why the vision of Rebbe sought to call somebody at four in the morning and talk about dessert and chicken. Because if a person stays aloof, if a person says that I'm removing myself, ain't a yachol shia, you'll never wipe away the tear from a friend. And that's what a person needs more than anything. I have to tell you, in preparing for tonight's topic, we know how good Hashem is to us. Hashem is so good to me in preparing for tonight's topic. I was teaching a Gemara last night, and the following lightning bolt was shot at me. I told it over today to two or three Torah giants, and they were like beyond, beyond, OTC, off the charts, with how much they liked it. So I knew that it's good. And it's in honor of Madregos that Hashem let me think about it. Before moving on to the second half, you know how I want to end the first half? So what can I do? I'll tell you. I taught a Gemara last night that said that there are many types of ways to make a Kenyan, loosely translated to acquire something. I'm not giving an in-depth Talmud shear now, but I'll give you the elevator pitch. One way you could make a Kenyan is with Chazaka. Chazaka means that a person does an action for someone. You can make a Kenyan with Mesira, you hand over something. With Meshicha, you pull something. Chalipin, you barter. Hagba, you lift something up. I just gave you a quick potpourri of how to make Kenyanim. At the end, the Gemara says, I believe in the name of Reb Shimon. While all Kenyanim work in some cases and do not work in others, there's one that's your go to Kenyan. There's one that works the Makam. It's called Kenyan Hagba'a, 
the one where you pick up and lift an object. That's a quote. Well, all other kinyanim sometimes work, sometimes don't. Hagba, you could put your money on, bank on it, and take it to the bank. So last night I thought to myself homiletically, and someone said to me afterwards, a big Torah giant, it's not such homiletics. I think what you're saying is actually accurate, spot on, correct. Sometimes when dealing with people and wanting to make an acquisition and make our point, sometimes we take the approach of a king in chazaka. I'm going to do it with strength. I'm going to show what I got. I'm going to prove with every crossing the T and dotting the I. With chazaka, I'm going to win you over. Yeah, sometimes it works, most times it doesn't. Sometimes I think the way that I'm going to make an acquisition and a dent in you is I'm going to make a Kenyan Meshicha. I'm going to pull you over to my side. I'll win you over. I'll be suave. I'll be stunning. I'll be elegant. Meshicha, I'll pull you over to my side. Yeah, sometimes it works. Most times it doesn't. There's one thing that always works. Kenyan Hagba'a. Raising a person up. Raising them up. Making them feel good telling them what they could become and accomplish. That, my friends and family, always works. And I really think that in honor of Madregos and tonight, I was able to think of that Torah thought. So in dealing with someone, you want to take the approach of Chazaka? Yeah, you might be effective. You want to take the approach of Mashiach? Maybe, it's iffy. But Kenyan Hagba'a, lift them up, make them feel good, let them believe. That works, Bechol Makayim, with the help of Hashem. And so before turning to a person who might be suffering from a mental health challenge, I beg, if you know someone who's going through a crisis or through an issue, if you know someone or their family, could you please from tonight's gathering remove the chayshech? Could you please be a person who lets that person know, well, I may not be able to do a lot. I do care. And that will go a tremendous amount, Hagba, when you lift the person up. You think you don't have the ability? I'll just end by telling you, uh, many years ago, a friend of mine was diagnosed and he wasn't well. He's about to start his first round of treatment. And the nurse practitioner walks into my friend who's beginning this process in uh, University of Miami, the Jackson system, actually more accurately, Sylvester. And the nurse practitioner says to my friend, who happens to be a rabbi, Rabbi so-and-so, be positive. Now my friend told me he was very taken aback who is the nurse practitioner to walk in and tell me, be positive? I've had chizuk, I have strength, I've been a, 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 a pillar of strength, giving it over to my family. And he started to talk to the nurse practitioner and say to her, who are you to tell me be positive as if I haven't been? That was out of line for you, lady. And she turned to my friend and said, Rabbi so-and-so, take it easy, chillax. Not just chill out and relax, chillax. 20 minutes ago, I drew your blood for a blood test. And you asked me to tell you what your blood type is. So I merely answered your question, be positive. <laughs> Without going into more detail, believe me when I tell you, that's exactly, but exactly how the story went. But the nurse practitioner is right. For those who could be there for a friend to let them know that you care. For those who could remove chayshach like the vision of Tzarebbe. For those who want to be like Rabbi Yonis and Aibshit says, an effective leader and a friend. I ask you, be positive, whatever your blood type is. But don't let a person ever go home feeling alone. And for the person that is going through a challenge or a tribulation for the person in the family or the friend who might be suffering and until this evening by the three organizations it was a stigma and it was kept quiet 
and the awareness was not yet brought into the open like we said, Lechu nav Hashem, look here, hundreds came together to reason. Perhaps the best advice I could give uh, begins, I remember now about 15 years ago. It was a Shabbos afternoon not the greatest weather condition, not a hurricane, but hurricane-esque in nature. But our oldest daughter at the time, she was five, and she wanted to go with us to shul, to my Shabbos afternoon shear. I'm holding her hand. Hey, twigs were snapping, garbage cans were rolling. But I took her, may not have been brilliant, but I did. She liked going to the shear. I'm an emotional guy. In middle, I was swept away, not literally, poor choice of words, I was moved, and I turned to my daughter and I said, Gila, where are we going Shabbos afternoon in this weather condition, this inclement weather? We're not going shopping, we're not going to an entertainment center, we're going to teach and hear the word of God. I could imagine that in heaven the angels are saying to each other, for every step we're getting a mitzvah. One step, it's a mitzvah. Another step, it's a mitzvah. Step, mitzvah, step. I was literally getting so emotional hearing and envisioning the angel saying, step, mitzvah, step, mitzvah, step, mitzvah. My five-year-old turns to me and says, Tati, do you really believe what you're saying? I said, yeah, I do. I believe every step is a mitzvah. She says, then let me ask you a question. Why don't we start taking smaller steps? <laughs> That's what my five-year-old kid said. She's right. No one, and I mean no one, will meet success by taking upon themselves something unrealistic, ginormously large. Yes, I hope that everyone who needs help will seek proper help. And I hope that the help that they seek will be something that they are comfortable and satisfied with. But I think the most important thing I could say to somebody who might be suffering from a mental health challenge is, I beg and beseech, begin with a small step. That small step might be making a phone call one had been pushing off. It might be visiting or opening up to someone that one hasn't for months. But I ask you from the bottom of my heart, Please, together, let us take small steps. I'll share with you something that I had just thought of. In, uh, in, in, in Pirkei Avais it says, I thought of this about a month ago in Baruch Hashem, it was well received. In Pirkei Avais it says that if a person is, a person is walking on the way, and they're talking and learning or reviewing their learning and they interrupt to say ma no ilon ze, ma no anir ze. how beautiful this tree or field is they deserve to be put to death now i know that there are tons of answers to what did the guy do wrong i get it in honor of tonight's topic i'd like to suggest the following what is it that the person who was talking and learning did wrong when he saw a field and he said, Ma no anir ze. This is a very beautiful field and beautiful tree. I think the correct answer comes from the Philadelphia Rosh Hashiv Rebellion He says something very poignant and scintillating. We finished a bit ago the days of Sirius Haimer, where 24,000 students died of Rabbi Akiva. Everybody knows why they die. Shall I know who covered Zelazeh? They didn't accord each other proper honor. Really? Really? Rev Akiva, whose whole life was love your neighbor like you love yourself, his own students didn't accord honor? For real? Says the Philadelphia Rashi Rebellion Sway. When they looked at each other, yes, they accorded each other honor. But here's the key line, Rabbi Sai. They showed each other honor for the level that they were currently on and for who they viewed each other at that moment. Not for who the person was going to become. Not for who the person had inherent greatness and potential to become. 
And that was the fault. Oh, they gave honor. I'm facing you, you're facing me. We gave honor for the current status and level. But they did not accord the honor and the greatness for what was inherently potential, what could become. And that, says rebellious Sve, was the fault. I think that's the same thing that's taking place over here. You're walking by a field and all you see is a field? You don't see the potential? You don't see all the harvest and the grain that it could become? You walk by a tree and you only comment on the tree? That's a nice tree. What about the luscious payrise, the fruits, what it could develop into? Anybody who looks at a field, who looks at a tree, and doesn't see the greatness and the potential of what it could become, measure for measure, Mishaya ben you're limiting someone's growth, your growth is limited as well. I really believe that's the truth. When people view themselves, they should not view themselves where they currently are, but they should have the belief that with a small step, what they can become, what they could accomplish, the inherent greatness. Everybody knows that Rav Gifter that tells the Rosh Hashiva says, we just read the story of the spies, the Miraglim. And the Torah of the verse says, we were like grasshoppers in our eyes and that's the way they viewed us. Shouldn't the order be just the opposite? They viewed you as grasshoppers so that's the way you felt? No, says Rav Gifter. If you have low self-esteem and you view yourself as a grasshopper, then that's the way that others are going to view you. And I certainly hope that the first step is the ability to believe, the ability for a person to have the drive by getting the proper help, by seeking the proper avenues, to look inside and not merely see an Elon, not merely see a field, but see the growth, see the potential, see all that could possibly become. I know there's a story I mentioned recently, I'll tell you this then conclude. Somebody had unfortunately, uh, a group of boys years ago were playing prank phone calls, but they took it to a new level. They were calling great rabbinic leaders and they were asking bogus halachic questions. It was one kid's turn to call Reb Moshe Feinstein. He called at 11.30 at night. The Rebetzin said, the Rosh Hashiva is sleeping. Should I wake him up? And he said, yes. She wakes up Reb Moshe. She comes to the phone hearing us a question. He washes his hands. He says, what's the question? And right away, back upon being asked the question, he realized it was a fake, bogus question. It was a scam. It was a prank phone call. Reb Moshe asked the boy where he learns. The boy didn't want to answer. He thought he was going to get in trouble. Reb Moshe says, you're not going to get in trouble. I want to know the care, concern of Reb Moshe was legend. He told him where he learns. He asked him what Kimara he's learning. He asked him what page he's on. He asked him a question on a toaster. He asked the boy, do you understand? The boy said, no. It's a miracle the boy knew what he was learning. Reb Maisha had patience beyond. So Reb Maisha, without a Gemara, started to teach the boy Gemara, Rashi, Toysus, line by line, word by word, the whole page. He did it one time. He asked the boy, do you understand? No. Like Reb Preda, he taught it again and again and again. Finally, after an hour of the legendary patience and love of Reb Maisha, he asked the boy, do you understand? The boy said, yeah. He asked him the question again. The boy said, that's a great question. Reb Moshe says, tomorrow when you go to yeshiva, ask your Rebbe that question. They're sitting in class. The boy raised his hand. He never raised his hand for anything meaningful. So all of a sudden, the Rebbe says, what do you want? The boy asks the question. The Rebbe says, that's amazing. Where'd you get it from? He says, I got it from Reb Moshe Feinstein. The Rebbe worked on the question the entire week. At the end of the week, he came back and he gave the class, including the boy, the answer. The boy came home Thursday evening. He ran to his room. He locked his bedroom door and he was crying. His parents tried to come in. He finally let them in and they saw cascading tears. They asked him what's wrong and he said, I am ready to go back to yeshiva. 
Reb Moshe believed in me. I didn't believe in myself. People didn't believe in me. But Reb Moshe believed in me. And if Reb Moshe believes in me, then I believe in myself. And I'm ready to go back to Yeshiva. I obviously can't tell you who this man is, but today, he's a well-known Magid Shir, a teacher of students in a very prestigious Yeshiva Gedaila in the tri-state area. Because to quote this boy 40 years ago, when no one believed in me, when I didn't believe in myself, Reb Moshe believed in me. And if he could believe in me, I'm ready to turn my life around. It's a person believing in themselves. It's a person going through an issue or a crisis or a difficulty and saying, I'll take a small step. I'll make the call. I'll go for the visit. I will speak to the person, but I will believe in myself, not view myself of who I am now and today. Rebellious face said you can't do that, but who I'll be in six months, who I'll be in two years, what I will become, the inherent greatness. I'm just going to conclude with a quick story that's my bracha to everyone. In a yeshiva recently, there was a boy who had a question and he didn't have the answer. The rabbeim said, go look in the library if anybody asks your question. He finds the question asked in a safer, but he didn't love the answer that was given. So he asked his rebbe what to do and the rebbe said, go see who wrote the safer, take the safer to the machaber, the author, and tell him that you challenge his answer. So he takes the safer, he sees it was written by somebody whose first name is Yosef, with an address. He gets on a bus in Israel and he knocks on the door ready to challenge. An elderly woman answers. The boy respectfully says to the elderly woman, is Yosef here? He has not lived at this address for more than 10 years. But if you want him, I'll give you his address. She gives the new address of Yosef, he takes the safer, armed with his question on the thing that Yosef wrote. He gets there, off the bus, knocks on the door, the door opens up, and the kid doesn't know whether to cry, run, or do both. There's a guy standing there, long, long ponytail, multiple body piercings, tattoos over the body, tie-dyed clothing, and I'm being kind. He says to the guy, are you Yosef? He says, yeah. You're the one who wrote the Sefer? Yeah. He didn't tell exactly with all the body piercings, tattoos all over the place and tie-dyed clothing. He didn't know what to do. He says to the kid, what are you doing here? He says, there's something in your Sefer I didn't like, so ask it to me. And all of a sudden, as if he would have been transported to his world from 20 years ago, he hears the kid's question and he starts fencing and defending and fencing and defending and back and forth and forth and back like he would have been the days 20 years earlier in yeshiva. He explained to Yosef what happened to him, how he left, how he went off, and why he is where he is today. But for those 10 minutes, he was fighting like a lion to defend what he wrote in his safer. Then sheepishly he turns to the boy and says, you have my safer? He says, yeah, I have one copy. Yosef says, I don't own one, can I have it? He gives him the copy, he gets on the bus and goes back to Yeshiva. He tells his Rebbe the story and the Rebbe said, the woman, the woman's obviously his mother. Go call his mother and tell his mother you found her son. He runs to the payphone. Yes, there was such a thing just a bit ago, which is a separate talk. And he dials the mother and he says, I'm the one who was by you a couple days ago. And she says, hey, you listen to me. I don't know what you said to that person, but that Yosef is my son. And I don't know what you said to him. I haven't seen him or heard from him in more than 10 years. But he just called me an hour ago for the first time and said, Ma, I'm coming home. I don't know what you said to him, young man, but for the first time in more than a decade, I'm about to see my son. Maisa shahaya kach haya. I want to wish us all a bracha. Whether we are going to be there to remove someone's darkness, or whether we ourselves are going to take a small step and initiate a phone call or a visit or go to someone to help us 
and believe in ourselves. Everybody should realize they have the ability to write their own safer. For some, the safer might be like Yosef's 500 pages and found on a bookshelf. But everybody writes the book of their life. Everybody has many chapters, some long, some short, some better, some harsh, some good, some laughing, some crying. Just write the safer. Everybody, whether it's a person who is suffering from a mental health challenge or the one who's going to be there for that person. And in the merit that as of tonight's awareness, where we are openly, believe echad, uniting, caring, wiping away tears. Tonight is the night. Let everybody write their own safer. Let everybody be able to say to Hashem, I'm ready to come home. And in that merit, may darkness be erased forever and may it be replaced with light that we feel and experience in the best of health. Thank you, Rav Shapiro, for those inspiring words to guide us. Let's take a breather here. Okay. Dr. Norman Blumenthal, a licensed clinical psychologist practicing in Cedarhurst, New York, serves as Zachter Family Chair in Trauma and Crisis Counseling at OHEL and director of the OHA Miriam Center for Trauma, Bereavement, and Crisis Response. We are grateful to OHA Children's Home and Family Services for sponsoring his address to us this evening. Dr. Blumenthal, Dr. Blumenthal also serves as educational director of the Counseling Training Program for Prospective Clergy at Yeshiva University and is founder and chairman of CAHAL, a partnership of schools providing special education services. Dr. Blumenthal is a leader in the mental health world and instrumental in the causes of the health and wellness of Clydesdale. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Norman Blumenthal. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I learned tonight about a new cause for low self-esteem and depression. And that's speaking after Rabbi Shapiro. <laughs> It's really a great honor, and this is going to be a hard act to follow. Um, first of all, I also want to reiterate that the speech is not necessary. Looking at this, and looking at this crowd, and looking at this turnout, what a tribute to this town, and what a tribute to all of us, that there are these many people who will take time, out of even a very busy time of year, that Bain Ashmash is between school and camp, uh, to deal with this issue of mental health. I also want to thank uh, Yankee Greenberger, and uh, Rabbi Israel Matzliach and Goldi Kasev and Yudha Balsam and all the people that are instrumental in putting this together. Uh, many more years ago than I cared to think, um, I was just newly in the field and I was a member of a small shul and the rabbi during his sermon mentioned the very famous tshuva from Marsha Feinstein that whereas for general medical care you can go to anyone but if you're going to go for therapy you really should preferably go to someone was a Shomer Torah Mitzvah. As the only mental health professional in the shul, I felt I owed the rabbi a thank you for that gratuitous endorsement. So after davening, I went up to the rabbi and I said, Rabbi, I just want you to know that we in mental health feel the same way about rabbis. We feel if you have to talk to a rabbi, it's really important that he's a Shomer Torah Mitzvah. To which he responded, that's probably harder to find. Um, but we are living in very special times and times when they're great rabbanim, as we just heard from, and also plethora of very talented mental health professionals from within our community, and by the way, from within this community as well. I'm a little hesitant to be representing this topic, but I know how many talented and skilled clinicians there are here in Chicago, many of whom are friends of mine and colleagues. Um, my guess is that I'm invited only in the spirit of novelty, ain't navi iro and uh, probably the, my colleagues from Chicago are now in New York talking about the same topic. <laughs> um, what I want to do is start by reading excerpts from three very different types, call it writings or articles. The first one I was a little hesitant about, as you'll see, and I think I'm going to have to afterwards 
have some caveats and disclaimers, but I think the message is very powerful. So I'm going to read it to you, and I'm purposely leaving out the names of the parties involved. It's a summary about a report about a certain individual. Medical experts at Yale University had called for drastic measures to help Mr. Blank in the years before, but those calls, quote, went largely unheeded by his mother, according to a new study. The report, based on comprehensive examination of medical and school histories of Mr. Blank, 20 years old, found that he was, quote, completely untreated in the years before, close quote, for psychiatric and physical ailments like anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and also deprived of recommended services and drugs. The 114-page report did not find direct fault with those in Mr. Blank's life, but it did conclude that his mother had sought to appease her son and was inclined to accommodate his disabilities rather than treat them. After consulting Yale University's Child Study Center when his son was in ninth grade, Mrs. Blank resisted its recommendations that he take medication for some of his problems. Recommendations for extensive special education supports, ongoing expert consultation, and rigorous therapeutic supports also, quote, went largely, largely unheeded. Quote, it's not that his mental illness was a predisposing factor, it was his untreated mental illness that was a predisposing factor. The Yale team offered a comprehensive approach, but quote, the family pulled away from that and did not work with the team, in part because Mrs. Blank did not think it was possible for her son and she wanted to keep him sheltered. The report also faulted the school system for not doing a better job monitoring Mr. Blank's progress, educationally and emotionally. Each time he was allowed to receive his education in, quote, homebound environment because of difficulties had in social settings. That was a summary of the Yale University report on Adam Lanza, the man who was the shooter in Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newton, Connecticut, during which 20 students and six teachers were killed. Now, my hesitation was, I don't want to imply that if we don't get our children's services that they're going to become school shooters. Nor do I want to imply that people with severe mental illness are violent. In fact, most are very docile and passive. But, and, I, we're going to address this later, it's a very difficult issue. When a parent or adults recognize that a child needs therapy and the child doesn't want to go for therapy. And we'll address that hopefully later. But problems don't go away. That's the main point. These issues don't go away unless they're treated. And we have to recognize that. The following is sort of the conclusion of a fairly long sort of diary written by a 15-year-old girl from our community, from the Orthodox community, who made three suicide attempts. And I have to add, although I will not divulge who she is, although she gives me permission to read this, but she comes from the most loving, wholesome family you could possibly imagine. And here's her conclusion. I continue my therapy and different medications as well. I still have tremendous difficulties with anxiety, depression, and OCD, but I'm working on it. I try hard at school and I'm making new friends and becoming closer to different people. I'm still figuring it all out and I'm hopeful. I'm so lucky to have the most amazing family who cares about me and picks me up when I fall. I really love them. I wanted to share my story because I think that mental health is something people in our community don't really talk about. It's only talked about when some crazy shooting happens, which makes people think that everyone with mental illness is crazy. But that's not true. Mental illness is extremely common, especially among teens. If you met me, you would never realize I tried to kill myself. I am social, I get good grades in school, I dress normally, and I have never tried drinking, smoking, or drugs. I come from, quote, a normal family, and you would think I am a normal teenage girl. There's so many others like me, I'm sure. Mental illness is something we need to address as a community, and people suffering from it need to feel supported not shunned. I'd also like to talk about the tremendous impact social exclusion and rejection has on everyone, especially on those of us with mental illness. My friends leaving me out of their group is something that hurt me the most, and after hours contemplating, I still don't understand why it happened to me, but it did. I can, it can happen to anyone. Inclusion is something that the whole community needs to work on. Making the effort to reach out to someone can make that person's day. If you go out with a group of people, be mindful that when you post pictures on Instagram or Snapchat, as everyone who, who was not invited will see and maybe feel excluded. Watching my friends' daily Snapchat stories without me included, included was extremely painful and added to my loneliness and feeling of rejection. If inside you feel like something you are doing is not nice, then listen to those voices and find your inner strength to do the right thing. How would you feel if this happened to you? 
That's what you should say to yourself before making a decision to exclude someone. Start listening to what your conscience tells you. Stop making excuses. Stand up for that kid who is alone. Why am I writing this? I'm sure there are many other kids who are suffering from mental illness, exclusion or both, and they feel they don't have a voice to speak or someone out there who cares. We need to bring these issues out into the open. Schools need to discuss this. Rabbis need to bring these issues into their sermons. Parents need to discuss this with their children. And friends need to be more supportive of one another. It may just save a life. And the last one is an article that appeared in the New York Times, 6-23-2011, almost six years ago. And it's about a very famous psychologist. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of her. Her name is Marsha Linehan, the founder of DBT, the, the most preeminent treatment now for borderline personality disorder. And again, I'm reading an excerpt. Are you one of us? The patient wanted to know, and her therapist, Marsha M. Linehan of the University of Washington, creative a treatment used worldwide, had a ready answer. It was the one she had always used to cut the question short, whether the patient asked it hopefully, accusingly, or knowingly, having glimpsed at the macrame of faded burns, cuts, and welts on Dr. Linehan's arms. You mean, have I suffered? No, Marsha, the patient replied, in an encounter last spring, I mean one of us, like us, because if you were, it would give us all, all of us so much hope. That did it, said Dr. Linehan, 68, who told her story in public for the first time last week before an audience of friends, families, and doctors at the Institute of Living, the Hartford Clinic, where she was first treated for extreme social withdrawal at the age of 17. So many people have begged me to come forward, and I just thought, well, I have to do this. I owe it to them. I cannot die a coward. No one knows how many people with severe mental illness live what appear to be normal, successful lives, because such people are not in the habit of announcing themselves. They are too busy juggling responsibilities, paying the bills, studying, raising families, all the while weathering gusts of dark emotions or delusions that would quickly overwhelm almost anyone else. Now an increasing number of them are risking exposure of their secret, saying that the time is right. Moreover, the enduring stigma of mental illness teaches people with such a diagnosis to think of themselves as victims, snuffing out the one thing that can motivate them to find treatment, hope. There's a tremendous need to implode the myths of mental illness, to put a face on it, to show people that a diagnosis does not have to lead to a painful and oblique life, said Ellen R. Sachs, professor of the University of Southern California School of Law, who chronicles her own struggle with schizophrenia, and quote, the center cannot hold my journey through madness. We who struggle with these disorders can lead full, happy, productive lives if we have the right resources. These include medication, usually, therapy, often, and a measure of good luck, always, and most of all, the inner strength to manage one's demons, if not banish them. That strength can come from any number of places, these former patients say, love, forgiveness, faith in God, a lifelong friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come it has come in the world at large, and it certainly has come in our community, to once and for all remove the stigma of mental illness and to remove the shame of going for psychotherapy. Mental illness is exactly that. It is an illness like any other illness. It is painful. It is it's hard to find cures. It's dangerous. And it's a mixture, like all illnesses, of environmental factors and constitutional slash genetic factors. Someone can have a genetic predisposition for lung disease, they can live in the Swiss Alps and it never comes out, or they can live in a highly industrial town with a lot of pollution and they're, they're ill. And the same thing is true of mental illness. There's a predisposition. The genetics accounts for somewhere between 40 and 50% of just about every single diagnosis and every single mental illness. There are injuries, there are even suspicions that certain foods we eat, uh, I'm not talking about children, by the way, but certain foods we eat can lead to depression and anxiety, etc. It's a physical ailment with the environment, just like any medical ailment. And it's also treated and as I'm going to show you shortly, with a remarkable amount of success. Therapists, I think of all health professionals, are among the most motivated. Every one of them I know is constantly going to conferences, constantly trying to renew their skills, looking for supervision. I'm not sure if people in other professions are so motivated. 
and are doing a remarkable job. Let me just read just quickly some statistics. This is from a consumer uh, report study. It's uh, the 95 is a little outdated, but it sent 180,000 readers, of whom 7,100 responded, and so, etc. They found psychotherapy highly effective with 87 to 92 percent reporting significant gains. I haven't gotten there yet, but all right, I would say I'm about 75 percent. A study published in December 08 in the Archives of General Psychiatry found 45.8 percent of 2,188 college students and 47.7% of young adults not in college have at least one psychiatric disorder, but only 25% sought treatment. I don't want to have a whole bunch of other studies. I see I already used up half my time. But I just want to mention one more study. It wasn't the best study, but it was reported in the American Psychological Association in 2010, conducted by Drs. Eliezer Sch uh, Schnall, Sheldon Feinberg, and others, showing increased willingness on the part of the Orthodox community to seek out help although we still have a long way to go. And by the way, many of those who have untreated psychiatric uh, illnesses land up going to physicians. 60% of physicians to family physicians involve stress-related symptoms. A 2011 study by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation found that 30% of medical outpatients are afflicted with a range of mental illnesses, most of which go untreated. Researchers at the University of Washington estimate that overlooking mental illness add as much as $200 billion in healthcare costs due to incomplete treatment and repeated visits to medical facilities for ailments that are exacerbated by psychiatric conditions. And by the way, the, the trend now is something called integrated care, where we are placing mental health professionals in the physician's office. Owell is already doing it in gerontologist's office and is already hoping to initiate a similar program for pediatricians because, as, and I know if there are physicians here, but many of the first line physicians or healthcare providers will tell you that a big chunk of what they see of people coming with various medical ailments are really psychiatric. So what are some of the resistance? What are some of the hesitation? So let me address a few of them. First of all, the arguments I hear is, well, we didn't have therapists 50 years ago. We didn't have therapists 100 years ago. Everybody seemed fine. What, we didn't talk so much. It wasn't such a focus on mental illness. What's happened? Well, we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't even have art scroll. <laughs> Times change. People change. Situations change. And yes, today, mental illness is a major issue, and psychotherapy is a proven, validated treatment that is necessary for mental illness. And again, unless you want to join the Amish community, we have to live in our times. The other one I hear is, I don't believe in psychotherapy. When does psychotherapy become a religion that you believe in or don't believe in? I mean, do you believe in dentistry? <laughs> what? Where, again, it's a technique. There's studies. Everything that we do today is backed up with studies. The studies may be included. They're not blood tests yet. We can't look at a microscope and see depression. But whatever is done and whatever treatments have been implemented and are endorsed are treatments that have validity and involve, require extensive training. And then there's my favorite. Every bar person who comes to my house, whether it's a plumber, the electrician, the exterminator, or mishullah, they're all therapists. They all tell me how they are also therapists. I have a very easy way of handling that. I say, great, let me run by some of my cases by you. That puts an end to that conversation. But yes, there are people who are very sensitive. There are people who are very intuitive. But you know something? Somebody could be inherently very musical. But if they don't take training in music, if they don't learn notes, they can't play music. And as I said, therapy is a skill. And many people, as I said, we have many people who train in these skills. It's been hours and hours learning, like all the other professionals. It's no different. It's not witchcraft. And, you know, and by the way, there are today more and more kind of paraprofessionals. I'm involved in a program, as mentioned earlier, that uh, which are training now mashkichim in the yeshivas, mental health skills. Dave Pelkovitz and I are training rabbis at Yeshiva University in pastoral counseling skills. But part of training is to know how far they can go and when the mental health professional has to take over. I was instrumental a number of years ago in starting a mentoring program. And mentoring programs are wonderful. I hope you have them. We started a mentoring program in my neighborhood. For this, at that time, it was for rebellious teens. And it changed the complexion of my practice. 
because some of them are just angry kids who just had some gripes, had a mentor who could help them, and I could deal with the kids who really had bona fide mental illness. It freed me up. And therefore, we work collaboratively. And again, the same thing's happening in medicine. Today, you're not going to go and see a doctor. You'll see a nurse practitioner. You'll see a PA. You'll see other professionals. The doctor deals with uh, maybe at the tertiary level. And the same thing is happening in mental health. We have many paraprofessionals who are working in the field. But nevertheless, even those, and I, by the way, have to address myself, there are a lot of young people. It's a very popular field to go into. And many young people are coming into the field. Many young people are finding, especially in our community, especially, let's say, the men who don't want to interrupt, but they're learning, and I appreciate that. So they'll find some program that's very quick, maybe gives them credit for memorizing Tulas Khanna when they were in high school, or something like that. And they get degrees. But you have to understand, this is a very hard profession. I often tell the story, and if, I, if you've heard it already, I apologize. I had the very special zuchus in my years at YU to learn with Rav Aaron Kreiser, the front of the bracha. Those of you who know who Rav Aaron Kreiser was, he was an Altamir from China, a man who, the impact he had on me, I wish I would have known then. I might have even paid attention in Shir. But in my years in YU, everybody has basically become either a doctor or a lawyer. And in my senior year, my third year in a Shir, he was giving me some well-deserved musr. And at one point he said, you're going to medical school, right? And I said, no. Law school? I said, no. So what are you doing? I said, psychology. Psychology. He took me outside. I remember this to this day. With his finger in my face, he said, Blumenthal, you want to be a psychologist? You have to be a gone. He said, doctor, lungs a lung. But every patient who comes into your office is a partial bifnayatsma. And then he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, so listen to your professors and study hard because it's not an easy profession. And I want you to tell you that I'm in the field almost 40 years. And I have a good reputation. But every time a new patient comes into my office, I see why they cries in front of me. And I realize I'm starting from scratch. It's a very hard profession. But as I said, it, we have to, and okay, let me just, a few points that maybe have some legitimate concerns in terms of mental health. And then I want to talk about some things we can do as a community. Number one, I have heard from parents who have told me that they're hesitant to take their children to therapy because the children are taught to hate them, to hate their parents. And I have to say humbly and apologetically, there is an element of truth to that. We have become parent abusers. Part of it is our forefather Freud, who saw the parents as the evil cause for all problems. Part of it is also children are inclined. Children are inclined to find fault with parents. Not parents for children. It's an interesting thing. Much more so children for parents. And when you sit and listen to someone, and you hear it again and again, and you get close to the patient, you start believing them. And we have to be very careful, because I know very few ill-meaning or mean or there are abusive parents. But for the most part, most parents are parent and of children who have these ailments. As I mentioned earlier also, many of these are constitutional. Many of these are, are as a result of genetics, et cetera. And we have to be, as mental health professionals, be careful to understand and not to take it sort of with a grain of salt everything that we hear. There's another problem, and this is a serious problem, and that's the problem of money. Therapy is very expensive. I remember the very first Nefesh conference that we ran. Nefesh is the International Organization of Orthodox Mental Health Professionals. And Rodovid Kohn, who's the murder officer of Nefesh, <coughs> told the following story. He told Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, who went to an inn. And as he was leaving, he was talking to his Talmidim, and he talking about how wonderful the innkeeper is. And how the innkeeper, he takes people in, and he gives them to eat, and he gives them a room, and the tradition of Ramavinu, he's machnis orchim. And he's going on and on, and finally, one of his disciples said to him, but Rabbi, we paid him. He said, that was his parnasa. And that was a very important differentiation. Yes, we have to charge, because we, we, we need to make a living too, or we wouldn't go into this field. You know, we're not in Chinuch. Oh, no, I thought it was bad, okay. But, you know, we, we, we have to make a living. But S does not to say that we don't care, does not to say we don't go lift Nimish Rasadin, and the mental health professionals I know are very dedicated, caring, for the most part, dedicated, caring, and highly intelligent people who could have gone into other fields and made, made a lot more money. And I want to tell you something personally. One of the scariest things for me about being a therapist is how important I become to some very vulnerable people. It's frightening. I'll tell a story, it doesn't, not someone from our community, it was many, many years ago. I was treating a young adolescent. 
And at that time we had answering machines. We didn't have cell phones. And I noticed there were a lot of hang-ups on my answering machine. I didn't make much of it. I figured it was people trying to sell me something. I found out later that every day, several times a day, he used to call my answering machine because he had to hear my voice. Because that stabilized him. You know how scary that is? What happens if I have a sleepless night? What if happens if I have something troubling me and I'm not all totally myself? And what that can mean to somebody else? But we have to charge. In fact, I remember once, I once heard a story about a, a man in the 30s who had these irrational beliefs that he was going to be stripped of his belongings, separated from his family, and thrown into prison. And he went for what was considered a successful psychoanalysis to deal with these fears. Several years later, after his psychoanalysis, he was stripped of his belongings, separated from his family, and deported to Auschwitz, where he met his analyst. I, mean, I heard that, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a, it's a riveting story. So I decided to tell my mother that story. When I was all done, she had, a, she had assumed a wry smile, and she said, yeah, I know, Auschwitz was lousy with analysts. If I had known how much it would cost, I would have taken advantage of it then. But it is costly. And there are many things we can do. First of all, it's sometimes money well spent. I can't tell you how many people are tell, have told me that they made more money because of therapy, because they're functioning better, because they're more successful. And it's a funny thing, you know, if you need a root canal, you need a few thousand dollars, you scrounge it together, it's over. But this can be over a lengthy period of time. So let me make some suggestions at least. First of all, there, I mean, Put the money aside, it's very important, it's a treatment. If you can't, we have in New York, it's, it's very inadequate, but we have some gemachs that will provide money for psychotherapy. It's important and worthwhile cause. We do the same for other illnesses. We have clinics, and I want to tell you that the research shows, even though the clinics are largely manned by novice therapists, the research shows that young therapists are as successful as more seasoned therapists because they seem to compensate with dedication where they may lack in experience. So there's good treatment in low-cost clinics, and you should support those clinics. You should lobby politically. The government should pay, the insurances should pay for insurance, for, for therapy. It makes no sense to me, an insurance company that will pay for agenda change but won't pay for anxiety and depression. That makes no sense, and, we, and we're a voice. We can vote. And by the way, there are alternative therapeutic interventions. There's group therapy. And group therapy is an effective treatment, and it costs a lot less. And it's, again, these are considerations. There's another plea I want to make to you as the community, and it has to do with jokes. You know, humor is a very important part of life. Humor serves a very therapeutic function. One of my favorite lines is, life would be unbearable if it weren't so hysterical. When we can laugh about something, and I want to tell you, you heard I deal with tragedy and with death, People laugh about it. I remember one guy telling me that he knew he was in trouble when the chief oncologist in Duke University was telling him about Kabbalists in Israel. You know, it's, it's, they, we use humor. Humor serves two functions. Humor lightens the heaviness of things that we deal with. Humor also, if you analyze a joke, what's, what's a joke? Somebody leads you in one direction, and then suddenly there's a surprise. There's suddenly like a detour, something unexpected, and we find that amusing. Well, that's what life happens in life. You're going to work on 9-11, you think you're going to have no ordinary day, and suddenly the airplane's flying into the office building. That's sometimes what this is about with breakdowns and tragedies, etc. But there's never an excuse to make a joke at somebody else's expense. It's not funny when somebody is insulted and hurt. And there's so many jokes about mental illness and being crazy. As soon as somebody finds them as a psychologist, oh, I need a psychologist, oh, my friend needs a psychologist, oh, I'm crazy, oh, it's schizophrenic, ha, ha, ha. It's not funny. These are serious ailments. And when we make jokes about it, we exacerbate the, the stigma. We make light of it. Would you make cancer jokes? Would you make heart attack jokes? Would you make ALS jokes? Then don't make mental illness jokes. Don't make jokes about therapy because then it becomes more, they become more hesitant. Okay, let me talk a little bit about Shaduchim. I often say I never learned enough psychopathology to address Shaduchim. But I want to say there's a, you know, there are many miracles in our community, and I want to address one of them. We have children. They're more or less okay, but they have different kind of challenges. 
Maybe they have some depression, anxiety, maybe they have a learning disability, maybe there's some difficulties at home, maybe there's not so much shown bias, maybe there's not enough money. They have challenges and difficulties. And yet when they reach Shidduch age, something miraculous happens, they become perfect. And their families become perfect. They have no flaws. Everything is just right and perfect until they get married and then the flaws come back. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Right, first of all, I'll tell you a question I get asked, and I'm sure all my other mental, professionals, mental health professionals get asked too. I get a phone call, so I don't even know who the person is. My son was read with this girl, my, my daughter read this guy. I found out he was in therapy. I found out she was depressed, she had an eating disorder. I found out that the father suffers from anxiety. That the parents uh, had a period where they had a separation. Should I take the chance? And I have one question. Is the person in therapy, did the person deal with it? Does the person realize they have a, a predisposition in this area and they're ready to take care of it? If so, it's not only a problem, it's not, not a problem, it's a strength. Let me ask you a question. If you have to pick someone to raise your grandchildren, and you have a choice between someone who had this absolutely charmed life, never had a challenge, everything went exactly their way perfectly, or you had someone who faced some challenges, who faced some difficulties, and faced them, you know, took, took them on, dealt with them, went for help, and overcame them, who's better equipped to raise your grandchildren? How do you know what's going to happen? Now, I don't want you all running home and putting your kids in therapy so they get a shidduch, but it's, it's something that's something I haven't taken again. That's how we sort of, un that's how we help undo the stigma. Okay, very quickly, therapy itself, a few points. It's a very interesting kind of technique. It's based on a relationship. And in fact, there's two strains of thought in the field in terms of what's effective. There's some data that suggests that certain methodologies, CBT, DBT, EFT, by the way, all, all new techniques sound like text messages. That's the uh, reality today. They're all abbreviations. I don't even know what they stand for. But, but they, there are, there's, there's some data that suggests that these are very effective treatments, sometimes very effective treatments for specific disorders. There's another body of literature that suggests it's not even necessarily the technique, it's who does it. And by the way, that's true of medicine too. If a person can learn surgery, knows exactly what to do, but some surgeons just have a knack. But as I said, it's also a relationship. I remember, you mentioned surgery. I remember once one of my children needed eye surgery. And of course, we also go to the best doctor. And I found the best doctor, and I couldn't stand him. He was this little guy, very full of himself. He was just the kind of guy we used to beat up in the locker room. I, I, I hated him. I couldn't handle him. But he was the best surgeon. So I was on the phone with my mother, and I'm talking about it to, so, you know, for my son that he needs the surgery. And he's the best one, but I can't, I'm going on and on how much I hate him. And she waits them all done, and then she says, so your son won't marry his daughter. And I said, she's right, I'm not, I'm not having a relationship with him, I'm using him, but that doesn't work with therapy. Therapy's way to And I wanna tell you that when I get calls for referrals, sometimes just intuitively, I feel like, hmm, I think this person would be good for that. Sometimes I don't even know why, but that's part of the consideration. And if you go into therapy and just, you're not clicking with the person, doesn't mean the therapist is a bad therapist. I've had patients like that, we just don't click. And it is a relationship, an odd relationship, but it is, a tech, it is a relationship, and it does require cooperation. I just said I would address this. A very big problem are sometimes kids who need therapy, and they don't want to go. Do we force them? Because part of what works in therapy is that you need the cooperation of the patient. There's a joke in the field, you probably all heard it, about how many psychotherapists takes to change a light bulb, and the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. It's, if the person's not motivated, you can't get far. And not only that, I have to tell you, that I've had adults come to me for therapy. And they said to me, Doc, I probably should have come to you months ago. But I remember when I was a kid, my parents dragged me to this therapist and I hated it. And I had left me with a better, bitter aftertaste. And sometimes we have to weigh that. When we're sending in, sometimes it makes more sense to hold off with the therapy. Very often what I'll do is meet with the parents, sort of deputize them to be the therapist. And, and uh, not actually force the kid to come to something that they'll hate. Um, okay, I'm running out of time. I want to conclude with two stories, one of which I think captures what we're doing tonight in terms of destigmatizing, and the other one I think also captures the magic of therapy. The story that my first story I want to tell was mentioned earlier, a story about the revered and sacred Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And it's a story I heard from Ruchil Per, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Derech Eisan, Shiva Farakwa in my neck of the woods. He said many years ago, they had a, he had a student in the yeshiva who never was psychiatrically ill, had a severe psychiatric illness. 
And he did strange things. He did unusual things, not intentionally, because of the illness. And uh, he was sometimes a source of embarrassment to the yeshiva, but somehow they managed to contain him. One night after night said, he comes running to Rabbi Kerr, all excited, and told him that the night before he had a dream. And in the dream, the Baal Shem Tov, and Rabbi Moshe came to him, and Rabbi Moshe cursed him out. Now, Rabbi Kerr, knowing how mercurial this guy was, was already getting, Rabbi Kerr was getting, already getting very nervous, like, what do we do? So he, so he said to him, what did you do? He says, I went to the Lower East Side to the yeshiva to confront Rabbi Moshe. So now he was panicking. Imagine Rabbi Moshe taking all the tshuvas from all over the world, running yeshiva, having to give shir. And now this mentally unstable person is coming and telling him about dreams. You picture the two biggest guys in yeshiva is taking this guy by the ears and throwing him out in the street. What are you bothering about yeshiva? So he said to him, what happened? So he said, and I quote, he listened patiently. He asked me for mechila. And then he told me I must be special that I dreamt about the Baal Shem Tov, because he himself never dreamt about the Baal Shem Tov. The other story was a story I heard from my mother, Zichman Lebracha, in which she told me when she realized that she was liberated from the concentration camps. It was in actuality a year and a half after her liberation from Bergen-Belsen in 1945. Like many of the survivors, she landed up going to Sweden. Sweden took in many of the survivors, then told them to leave, but for about a period of a few years, took in some, many of the survivors. It's a young woman of 21, she had lived the previous seven years in varying ways under Nazi occupation. And a young, there was a young male refugee who took a liking to her, and he asked her out on a date. It was the first date of her life. It was a year and a half after her liber actual liberation. And he took her to a, a concert. And it seems it was the custom in Sweden, in these concerts, that the musicians would dress in uniforms and march in from the back of the concert hall down to the pit. So she's talking to her date, and suddenly there's a commotion, and she turns around, and there are blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryans in uniforms marching. So she went right back to the camps. She heard the shooting, the dogs barking, the screaming. She remembers her date calling her name. It was like he was miles away. And then, to her great sheer joy and amazement, these alleged Nazis sat down and played music. And she realized she was liberated. That's what happens in therapy. We go back to the dysfunction. We go back to the painful memories. We go back to the style of thinking that is ill-conceived. We go back to the triggers that may have in the past prompted an addiction. And we change the end of the story. We take the horror and make it into music. It's an exhilarating experience. And I hope we can do it and open, open our eyes and allow all of us to benefit when it's necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal, for giving us such crucial tools to address the challenges of mental health in our community. And thank you all for coming out to this event and giving us all renewed strength and support. I'd like to thank everybody who helped volunteer um, outside and uh, helping make sure everything was available and setting up all the tables in the back. Please make sure to use the packet that you received this evening, take advantage of all the available community resources, and to contact all the fine organizations mentioned here uh, for referrals. Marv will begin in just a few moments to my left. Good evening.